everyone and welcome to Psychiatry Grand Rounds. As chief resident, it's my privilege and honor to introduce today's speaker, Dr. David Kopaz. Uh, Dr. Kopaz went to medical school at the University of Illinois Chicago and also completed psychiatry residency there. Um, he is also trained in integrative medicine and has obtained additional certifications in yoga nidra and battlefield acupuncture. Uh, Dr. Kopaz's interests in psychiatry include integrative and holistic care, culture, spirituality, writing, and medical activism. He is a published author of four books in addition to numerous peer-reviewed studies and blogs. Dr. Kopaz is currently a UW assistant professor working at the Seattle Puget Sound VA as a psychiatry attending, and he is also a national whole health education champion through the National VA Office of Patient-Centered Care and Cultural Transformation. We are honored to have him here today. So please uh, unmute your microphones and give a round of applause to Dr. Kopatz. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> okay, well, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. I'm gonna try to leave some time at the end. Um, for some comments and feel free to um, uh, put things into the chat to let's see how this works in this system. Um, yeah, I can have the chat here. It's a little bit in the way. So I might keep the chat kind of minimized and try to watch if somebody pops something up. And Nick, if you see something that comes up in chat that I miss, would you mind just kind of interrupting me and I'll, I'll make sure we, we stop and attend to that? I'll do my best. Your okay. screen share looks good. Okay, thanks, thanks. So, you know, this is a topic that I've been increasingly interested in. And as I went back through my own life of like, how did I get interested in the idea of medical activism? I've looked at a number of different events that were professional and even pre-professional in my life. And so I'm gonna use myself, you know, just as, as in psychotherapy, we use the self as a tool um, for, uh, understanding our patient. I'm going to use myself as a tool for understanding, you know, possible pathways of medical activism and also um, talking about general ideas and concepts of what that is. And my view is that that is important to include as part of professional identity and should be taught in medical school and residencies. So I have no financial disclosures to uh, disclose, uh, learning objectives. So I'd like us to look at how to define medical activism. I look at it as kind of a moving target. I'm gonna give my definition uh, and I'm going to look at related concepts of the witnessing professional that Robert J. Lifton speaks of and the new professional that Parker Palmer speaks of. We'll review the literature on medical activism, which is not immense, but um, it, there is some literature on this. Um, and we'll look at the moral determinants of health. This is what Don Berwick calls the social determinants of health, that they're not just social, but they're actually moral imperatives that we as healthcare providers need to attend to. Um, they've also been called the political determinants of health because while they may be social and moral, uh, political um, policies tend to shape uh, many of the social determinants of health. And we'll also look at the idea of a social mission in medicine. We'll consider how to apply medical activism in one's own practice, um, consistent with personal and professional values, and we'll evaluate when medical activism is consistent with professional ideals and when it loses sight of professional standards. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, can medical activism go too far? Is there a time where you lose your professional objectivity and you're no longer, um, you know, a doctor activist, you're just an activist? So I think that's important that we don't undermine our professional um, kind of obligations or the view of the profession in the public's eye uh, by being too biased in our activism. So it's always something that needs to be undertaken with um, a lot of discernment. And I would say um, with an ongoing um, kind of evaluation of what you're doing and saying and whether that's coming from professionalism or that's coming from uh, yourself as an individual. So the other caveat there though is many advances in scientific and cultural standards at the time 
um, there's a lot of pushback from the status quo against people who say, hey, you know, we should be doing things differently. So, um, for instance, Semmelweis, uh, when Semmelweis said, hey, you know, when we go from the um, cadaver lab to deliver babies, we should wash our hands. And so that idea was was kind of radical at the time. It's hard to believe that now, but you know, Semmelweis ended up, uh, you know, being ridiculed, uh, kind of leaving or being driven out of practice, and ended up, you know, having a nervous breakdown. Um, Virchow, when Virchow talked about um, the role of uh, politics and medicine, he ended up getting fired from his job. So uh, just because you get pushback doesn't necessarily mean you're not in the moral um, right, but at the same time, you need to, just because you're getting criticized, it doesn't mean that you're right either. So that's, that's kind of a, a razor's edge to walk there. So what is medical activism? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Uh, is it part of medical identity? Is it learned or taught? Is it foundational or is it peripheral and optional to professional identity? Is it something that a few people do above and beyond being a clinician? And I'd be interested here in seeing in the chat, do people wanna just pop in there? I mean, what's your, your kind of knee jerk reaction to the idea of medical activism? We haven't defined it or talked about it yet, but um, you know, if anyone wants to just put in the chat what their initial thoughts are at the beginning of the talk here. So I got my chat box open. I'll kind of watch for that if anyone has, has thoughts on this. Okay, so let's go ahead and give, um, I'm sorry, a little bit of a, a working definition. So these are, are some of the ways I think about medical activism. Should be foundational to professionalism, but often is not taught, right? Yep, I agree with that, Kirsten. Um, so working beyond the four walls of the clinic to make the world a better place. That could be a very simple definition of medical activism. Two broad categories that I kind of think of are reforming the healthcare delivery systems that we work in and the way that we give healthcare to individuals, and then also action in the political, social, cultural, legal, economic, relational, and natural environments. Yeah, David, so it feels optional. Yeah, right. So it's, it's kind of a, what is that? Um, so only the few are called type of thing, you know, of people who find themselves in, in unusual situations. Um, and, and we'll hear from people who kind of explain that. And Cody, push being at foundational, it's not what's practiced, right? Right. So, and, and definitely in the last few years, it's come much more into um, the dialogue of education. I'm reading... Uh, Gianna, I'm not sure if I'm saying your name correctly, um, knee-jerk reaction that it's incredibly important. Yeah, and individuals working together. So that's another thing too, is like, you know, there's sort of the heroic, um, charismatic version of activism where, you know, one person kind of fighting against the world, it's sort of the American, you know, kind of action movie. Um, but in reality, really takes a huge concerted effort to change public policy, to change laws, to um, change public consciousness, an ethical requirement. Yeah. So good. So we're getting some different thoughts in here. I'm going to move the chat box over and look at the right-hand column here. So activism can take many different forms. The essence of it is when caring and healing extend beyond an individual client to include factors we know influence individual and public health, the social, political, and moral determinants of health. And um, I'll take a sip here. So there's a story uh, some of you might have heard, kind of like a, a parable type thing or a teaching point of there's somebody standing by a river and there's all these babies floating down the river. And so there's this one person, they're wading out into the river, they're grabbing every single baby they can and they're, they're you know, just working incessantly. And a second person walks up and says, oh my God, what's happening here? And the first person says, there's all these babies in the river, we have to get them out. And, and so the first person jumps back into the river and then turns around and sees the second person walking away. And he says, you know, how could you turn your back on all these babies? They need immediate attention. And the, the second person says, I'm going to go see the son of a gun who's throwing all these babies in the river upstream. So to go upstream and solve the problem. So that's kind of a, like a root, going to the root of the problem rather than treating um, 
you know, kind of the surface symptom. And that's a big public health type of perspective of, you know, you can try and treat every individual, but if there's something in the society or something in the culture or the environment that's causing this illness, um, a public health perspective would be, well, let's go to the root. And that's a little different than the way we're trained as clinicians, where we're often trained to be working one-on-one. -on -one. Root of the problem is subjective. Um, it may be, I mean, this situation with the babies, that's an objective thing. You know, you're seeing babies in, in the river. So that parable may work because um, it objectifies something that's often more um, subjective. But that's a, a good point of, of medical activism is something that you have to decide as an individual, is this something that you see as part of your professional work? Or is it something that is uh, something you do on the side on the weekends or evenings? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and minimize the chat here. And I'll watch to see if anything pops up a little later. So here's another way I've talked about medical activism. This was a um, kind of a blog or essay I wrote for Closler out of Johns Hopkins. And um, they have a, a Closler uh, is kind of a acronym sort of of getting closer to Osler. So looking at kind of patient uh, therapeutic relationship in medicine. And so uh, what I described here was how we define ourselves determines our responsibilities. So, you know, often we're kind of trained, like if, if responsibility comes up, then we would deal with it in the future. Except if we define ourselves as technicians who have a narrow scope, who are following orders, um, we have one outcome. But if we define ourselves as true professionals, working for the health of not just one patient in an exam room, but for the health of all, we would have a different set of responsibilities if that's part of our core identity. And so I think this is why it's really important to have discussions in medical school and residency about whether this is part of our identity because it's going to predetermine some of our actions um, and responsibilities later on. So if we define ourselves as technicians with a narrow scope of being protocol managers, we will do just as we are told and stay in our lane. The stay in our lane thing that came from the National Rifle Association where they told doctors that um, gun violence was not a health issue. Um, it was a, a kind of a political or, or a constitutional issue. Many doctors pushed back on this and said, you know, um, gun violence is in our lane because it's particularly ER or trauma surgeons in urban centers are dealing with gun violence all the time. So this was kind of a debate that was going on a couple of years ago uh, over social media about what's, what's our lane. So um, if we just stay in our lane and follow orders and place institutional priorities over our patients and our own well-being, um, you know, then we've got this narrow scope as a technician. If we view ourselves as professionals, we still have to have uh, be good technicians. So, so being a, a technician in philosophical terms is um, necessary, uh, but not sufficient to being a professional. A professional must be a good technician, but a professional also goes above and beyond. Um, so we have this higher responsibility and calling, uh, which I'm defining as medical activism. So these are some domains. I'm going to open the chat again here. Um, if anybody has ideas, I mean, I'm looking at this as a work in progress, and these are just some of the different things I've come up with. I'm not going to um, rattle all of them off necessarily and read them, um, but there are different areas where medical activism um, could be applicable. So some of the things that I've looked at a lot are, are you know, medical education, preserving idealism and preventing cynicism, uh, staff self-care, burnout, moral injury, some of these things down at the bottom. Um, also peace work in a way, you know, I work with um, Joseph Rael, I'll talk about in a few minutes, and he's been recognized by the United Nations uh, for his work um, toward world peace. And I've come to look at working with veterans as a form of peace work where we're helping people come home from military, come home from the war and um, helping them to go from a war mentality to a peace mentality. So even though you might not consider that on the surface, uh, peace work or, or peace activism, um, it shapes your <clears throat> responsibility in a different way if you look at it um, from that perspective. So um, let's go ahead. So anything else, uh, anything that comes to you as we're going through the talk, just go ahead and pop it into the chat box there because I'm always trying to update this list. Okay, so 
is the practice of medicine a political act? Because some people might say, well, medicine and politics should be separate, kind of like church and state or something, that when we're doing science and medicine, that's one thing. And when you're doing politics, that's another thing. So here's a few quotes that kind of blur that distinction a little bit. Carol Hanisch, coming out of the feminist movement in the you know, 70s and 80s, said the personal is political, that what, what you're experiencing actually has political ramifications. Foucault, who you know wasn't a doctor but was a, um, a philosopher, uh, said the first task of the doctor is therefore political. The struggle against disease must begin with a war against bad government. And during this pandemic, I mean, this, this may have seemed like a radical statement before the pandemic, but there's many perspectives now that I think you could take and say, you know what? We have a responsibility as physicians to try to protect the public health in something like a pandemic. And then uh, Virchow, this famous quote, medicine is a social science and politics is nothing more than medicine on a large scale. So here, Virchow uh, equates medicine and politics. Um, and you know, maybe that's why he got fired um, from his job. So um, I see some corrections in the chat box there. Any, um, I don't quite understand what that is, uh, is about. If you, Scott, if you can kind of clarify that. Okay. This is Berwick, you know, so Don Berwick, I've mentioned um, him a couple times, and he wrote this really nice paper that uh, is short, you know, it's maybe two, three pages um, with the references, and it's definitely worth reading. It's uh, very inspirational. So Berwick writes, you know, imagine for a moment that the moral law within commanded a shared endeavor for securing the health of communities, and imagine further that healing professions together saw themselves as bearers of that news and leaders of that change. And so here's some bullet points about what he says we should do if, if we healing professions take up the, the um, moral imperative to treat the community as well as the individual. We'd sign on to basic international human rights uh, treaties and conventions. We would um, make laws that healthcare would be a human right, not something that's based on the marketplace of whether you have um, healthcare or not. Uh, restoring leadership to reverse climate change, uh, radical reform of the criminal justice system, uh, achieve, uh, ending policies and exclusion, uh, and achieving compassionate immigration reform, ending hunger and homelessness, and restoring order, dignity, and equity to democratic institutions, ensuring the right of every person's vote to count equally. So these, a lot of these are really political issues, but they all have health implications. And I'm going to check the chat here again. Oh, in corrections. Oh, definitely. Okay. Yep. I'm going to do that. Prison, prison psychiatry or corrections. Yeah. A lot of people who do that, you know, it's a high burnout job. And so many people have a calling um, to, to do that kind of work. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. I'll add that to my long list. And anything else that people think of, you know, feel free to, to pop that in the chat. Okay, so here's uh, more about the moral determinants of health. So um, Berwick continues and says, the moral force of professional leadership can also be powerful once grounded and mobilized. A difficult question follows. Ought the health professions and their institutions take on this redirection? To use the recent vernacular, what is healthcare's lane? So I think this is a, a question that's up for debate. And um, I forget, uh, like a dean in Pennsylvania said that um, activism doesn't have a role in medicine, that it's kind of interfering with um, the learning of science and the learning of professionalism. So that dean's opinion was, you know, no, it doesn't have a role. Other people are saying, yes, it definitely has a role. And I think many younger people um, are really, really getting on board with it. Like, uh, for instance, uh, University of Washington, I don't know if this applies uh, to your guys' place in Idaho, to y'all's place in Idaho, but um, there was uh, a letter that went out to all the faculty that said, please incorporate um, DEI and social determinants of health in your existing lectures. And so 
one of my thoughts with that, you know, because that seems like that's coming from a desire for students and residents and trainees to have that included, and some faculty, you know, are saying it should be included as well. One of my thoughts is some of the older faculty may not have been kind of versed or schooled in this, and so maybe we should be co-teaching. You know, there might be situations where medical students or residents are more versed with um, what's going on as far as the social cultural change in the country right now than some of the older attendings. So that was just an interesting idea I had of um, maybe rather than demanding, demanding that the um, attendings teach things a certain way that the students and residents want to hear, maybe it could be done uh, collaboratively. So anyway, Berwick, that was an aside there. So Berwick says this final statement that I really like, healers are called to heal. When the fabric of communities upon which health depends is torn, then healers are called to mend it. The moral law within insists it so. So Berwick really kind of threw down kind of a glove or a gauntlet or something, or however you want to say it, a challenge, you know, a call for us to say, hey, we've been saying these social determinants, we know they affect health, but we've been saying, yeah, but that's something out there that maybe public health people should deal with. And he's saying, you know, no, actually, all of us within healthcare and all healthcare institutions should be taking on social determinants of health because they're moral determinants of health. Okay. So um, here's a perfect example, a nice short little example. Uh, Mona uh, Hannah Atisha from um, Flint, Michigan. So she starts her book, uh, What the Eyes Don't See, with this quote. This is a story of resistance, of activism, of citizen action, of waking up and opening your eyes and making a difference in our community. I wrote this book to share the terrible lessons that happened in Flint. But more importantly, I wrote this book to share the incredible work that we did. And notice she doesn't say I did, but we, we did as a, as a community, hand in hand with our community to make our community care about our children. So here's a perfect example of activism. Uh, I think she was a pediatrician, noticed a lot of um, abnormal lead levels, got involved in uh, local politics to try to protect the health of her patients as well as the whole community. So how does one develop social consciousness? Any, any thoughts? Put those in the chat box. I'll open that up again. Are you born with it? You know, do you learn it before medical education and maybe like um, family or, or um, you know, religious education or um, spiritual education before you get into formal training? Yeah, Bethany, uh, experiencing and witnessing injustice, right? So you see it and then you respond. So, um, and one of the things we'll talk about is, are there ways to train people to be more likely to respond? Because if any of you know about um, like social psychology by uh, bystander or witness effects, you know, there's all this whole body of research that a bunch of people see something bad happening and they don't respond. It's, it's a social psychology phenomenon. People are like, oh, it's not my fault or not my responsibility. Someone else will do it. Maybe it's not as bad as it seems. So, um, so we have to kind of be vigilant about the bystander effect. And Lindsay, um, it's not taught, it's caught. I like that. Yeah. I might write that down. Do you know where that saying comes from? Is that just kind of a vernacular or... Um, do you know if somebody specific said that it's not taught, it's caught? More than being told about it, seeing it in action. Yeah, moving from the, the experience of something versus the theory of it. Like, you know, I trained, um, I did all my family practice in medical school and surgery at Cook County Hospital uh, in Chicago, inner city Chicago. And, you know, you could read about that, but when you go in, you just see, you know, the diversity, um, the poverty, people coming in with advanced cancer, you know, that you're just like, how could somebody let this cancer erode through the skin and never come in for treatment um, and then be lost to treatment, come in for surgery and never follow up? Um, so I wish I had the reference. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you find it, uh, let me know. If anyone else can, can look that up, feel free to 
to pop that in the chat box. So let's see, do you learn it before? Um, can you learn it during medical and postgraduate education? Is it something that's thrust upon you? That's what Lindsay's saying. It's not taught, it's caught. It's like you're going about your, your life like uh, Mona, uh, Hannah Atisha, and you've got all these patients, all these little kids with lead, lead poisoning, you know, high lead levels. Um, you weren't looking for it, it just came to you. And is it latent or developed? Um, does it kind of lie quiescent or is it something that you can kind of train in? So we'll look at some of these questions as we go through. Okay, so as I look at myself, one of the things I come back to a lot of times is, you know, was it because I was into punk rock, you know, as a kid? I was sort of you know, in high school, I graduated high school in, in 85, 1985. So I was a little bit more of like, you know, kind of a, a post-punk new waiver type of kid in, in high school and college. But I really listened to a lot of punk rock, and I liked a lot of the reading material that came along, like um, Crass, which was an anarchist band out of um, out of England, and Flux of Pink Indians. I apologize if anyone's offended by the the term. A lot of um, punk names were meant to be kind of provocative or inflammatory. I, I don't think that they necessarily had. Um, were trying to slur Indians or something, but that was the name they came up with. Later, they changed their name to Flux, so maybe they kind of thought about that. But um, if you look in the lower right there, this is one of my favorite uh, punk albums, Strive to Survive, Causing Least Suffering Possible. So, um, and here's one of their songs, TV Dinners from that album, so on the, on the left here. And so, the first part's kind of spoken word, you know, violence on TV, violence on the news, reality and fiction both served up neatly to keep us all amused. Reality and fiction have both become the same. That sounds a little bit like, you know, recent times here when you think about all the propaganda and um, kind of false uh, information about the uh, pandemic going on. Um, instead of facing the facts, we search for new scapegoats to blame. And then this is the chorus, and then this would be kind of fast and shouted, you know, uh, it's not great poetry, but, you know, when the, when the guy's shouting it, it kind of works. Um, you know, the time has come to stop sitting back, to say, no, we've taken enough of this crap. Violence isn't acceptable in any form, so let's work together to make peace the norm. And then it kind of goes back into the spoken word and says, you know, the blame lies not with the system. The blame lies not with the state. The blame lies within each and every one of us. So they're, they're teaching this personal responsibility. A lot of punk rock get into this oppositional thing, you know, kind of anti-authoritarian. But they're saying, um, and this is kind of through their albums, uh, one of the things that I like about them is this kind of philosophical approach and personal approach to say, you know, the system is made up of individuals. So if all the individuals change, that will change the system. So what's the punk rock ethos for those of you who are kind of not familiar with it? Anarchism um, is one of them, like particularly with these bands. Now, anarchism could be like pure id expression. Like there was a Scottish punk band called The Exploited and they had a song called Sex and Violence. And those were the only words. They kind of chanted it, they sang it, they shouted it, sex and violence for I don't know how many minutes the song went on. You know, that's kind of glorification of, of Freud's id of just like people wanting pure uh, expression without any holding back. But there's other strands of anarchism that have all these kind of activist elements of equality. Like if you look down at the bottom there, the E with a circle around it, that's for equality. You got the peace sign and the equality and A with the circle around it was anarchism. So um, other elements or, or values are nonconformity, um, anti-authoritarian, anti-consumerism, anti-capitalist, anti-exploitionist, um, anti-war, pacifism, um, vegetarianism, and veganism, uh, and this concept of DIY, do it yourself, of like, if you see a problem, or if you want to start a band, you know, don't just sit um, on your couch and complain about it, get out there and shout about it. Um, so, or, you know, write a tract about it, or, um, you know, make a fanzine and publish it and leave it around different places with, um, you know, your critique of society. So this is the thing about being a punk. Being a punk was to critique society. So I've wondered, you know, did, what role did this have? You know, was it that I was a shy kid here? You know, here you can see a few pictures of me and my family. You know, was it because I was sort of the shy kid who grew up in the country and sort of identified with people who didn't fit in rather than people who did fit in? Um, was it because we just grew up with animals and took care of animals? If somebody had an injured animal, they'd bring it to my mom. 
um, you know, wild animal or domestic animal. My mom did like schnauzer rescue and groomed dogs and raised dogs. My dad worked uh, with horses. He was a farrier uh, in one of his earlier jobs. Um, you know, was it this family influence that just made me think, okay, well, what's right and what's wrong? And, and how do I think about my role in society and my role as a professional? And then just, I don't know, I sought this out. I, I remember choosing as a medical student, there was a list of all these different um, options for a summer, um, what would you call it? Like a summer research experience in medical school where you'd get your tuition waived for um, a semester if you worked on a research project. So I worked with Deb Clayman and Linda Grossman on this um, topic that sounded really interesting. So what Deb and, and Linda and I did was we sent these questionnaires to all these residents to ask them PTSD symptoms looking back to their internship year. So this wasn't a clinical interview, it was just a self-report. And we found 13% um, of residents would tick off enough symptoms of PTSD that if those were clinically uh, causing problems, they would meet PTSD criterion from the stressor of internship. Uh, more women than men. Also, when we broke it down by specialty, uh, psychiatry and surgery were the highest rates for specialties with PTSD symptoms related to internship. And so, you know, from very early on medical school, this was between my first and second year of medical school, you know, Deb is writing this thing of um, training can be deleterious to physician well-being and potentially to patient care and suggests that the importance of making major changes in postgraduate medical training. So this was back 95 when we published it. And it would have been like I started medical school in um, 89. So the data set probably would have been around, you know, 1990 or something, I think, when we were looking at this. And then I continued to work with Deb and Linda uh, in residency. And we did this another, another big data set looking at student attitudes towards these different controversial topics. For instance, abortion, homophobia, and AIDS. And back then too, AIDS was a death sentence. You know, so when I was going through medical school and residency and doing my internal medicine, we'd have these people who were just kind of wasted away, young people wasted away, skin and bones, you're dying from AIDS. And so um, when AIDS first came out, there were doctors who said, well, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna expose myself to it. And a lot of that was the stigma around um, homosexuality and, um, and uh, IV drug use. So you're know, trying to tease out how much of the stigma is about these different issues, like uh, students' attitudes towards other people. And so we published these, these different data sets here. And now I kind of see these as, you know, this was also something that kind of added to this critique of, um, of uh, culture, critique of medical culture, and trying to shape students in such a way that we could help them not be discriminatory, not stigmatize others. Okay, and Anne, a good quality of life requires an action orientation, yeah. Quality disintegrates without consistent and intentional action, entropy, right, All right. So this idea that you need to be continually engaged and, and active, and that fits with um, Rebecca Solnit's book, uh, um, Hope in the Dark. So Rebecca Solnit, she's one of my favorite authors. She's great, great authors, written a lot of, a lot of really nice, uh, nice books, weaves in the personal and the political, um, as well as kind of the artistic all, all together. And so she says in Hope in the Dark that being an activist doesn't mean fix the problem and go home. Being an activist is uh, almost a, a kind of identity or a way of being in the world in which you're always trying to um, correct imbalances and you're always looking at things from the eye of an activist. It's not something you do just for uh, a few months. So yeah, I like that about the action orientation. Thank you. So Carl Bell, so around University of Illinois, Chicago, one of the reasons I chose that um, residency program was because people were really diverse and eclectic in their interests. And um, we had a social community focus 
we had still had a lot of psychoanalysts. So there was a strong psychotherapy focus as well as the biological and neuro, uh, neuropsychiatric approaches that, that we were learning. So Carl Bell, um, he was around in, in our grand round, something like this when we were meeting in person and he would speak up and always was challenging um, kind of in the box thinking and status quo thinking. So he, um, in his book, The Sanity of Survival, it's his collected papers, He's passed away a couple of years ago. So he was looking at, is racism a psychopathological symptom? Uh, and is it part of narcissism? Are racists potentially diagnosable with narcissistic personality disorder? So the second quote he says here, the racist individual suffers from a psychopathological defect of developmental processing involving narcissism, which precludes subsequent development of such qualities as creativity, empathy, wisdom, and integrity. So, and then he goes on to say, you know, how much of, of racism is learned, how much of it is um, uh, kind of taught, how much of it is, is experience, a little bit almost like it's the flip side of medical activism. Um, it would be kind of like the, the um, anti-activism, I guess you could say. So I didn't have a lot of contact with Dr. Bell personally, but he was somebody who was in the department and influential. Uh, he was a good friend with Steve Wine, and Steve I had a really close mentoring relationship with, and Steve was a human rights psychiatrist. Um, he wrote these books here about Bosnian refugees and testimony, and Steve, the reason I sought Steve out is he was another person in Grand Rounds who would stand up and say, and challenge things, things that you would think, okay, I know what we're saying as psychiatrists. And he would say, we need to think of things as you know, human beings. We need to think about the moral implications of that. We can't just kind of have these easy answers and stay within the DSM. You know, we also need to look at what's going on in the world around us. And I was like, wow, this guy, he seemed fearless. You know, he spoke up, um, he um, was thought provoking and he had a really reasoned rational base that he was drawing from. He wasn't just shooting off his mouth, you know, he's coming from um, kind of a, a literature and lineage, lineage of human rights and social psychiatry. So in testimony, he described testimony and said, um, the appropriate context for understanding testimony is not psychiatric disorders, but rather that of personal, social, legal, cultural, historical, and ethical relations. There's simply no way that culture, culture change, or peace and reconciliation can be explained by PTSD or other notions of individual psychopathological disorders or processes. So he really, you know, a couple of things here, he moved it from the individual pathology to a pathological system. People who've gone through war um, aren't mentally disordered people. They're people who've gone through uh, extreme catastrophes or extremity. Um, and if we only think of them as disordered individuals, then we lose sight of kind of the moral implications of human rights. So I worked with Steve for a few years and he was quite influential, as I said. Oh, and he worked under Allen Ginsberg. So the poet Allen Ginsberg, when Steve was in medical school, Columbia, I think he was in, in New York, he sought out Allen Ginsberg at a, a poetry reading afterwards and just kind of sat down. They started chatting and Allen Ginsberg took Steve under his wing and shared his own psychiatric records with him. Um, his mother had uh, uh, psychosis and was in and out of hospitals and Allen Ginsberg had been um, hospitalized at one point too when he was younger. But before he shared the records with Steve, he said, I want to make you into my kind of psychiatrist. So he didn't want an eager young psychiatrist to subject his visions to reductionistic psychiatric formulations and dismiss them as hallucinations like his um, formal psychiatrist at the time had done. So this is Steve talking in a paper that he wrote in the American, American Journal of Psychiatry. The story he eventually told me was a moving testimony to the aesthetic and spiritual dimensions of the visions. The things Alan taught me about psychiatry were powerful and transformative, ways of seeing outsiders, struggle, suffering, spirituality, art, drugs, and love that were clearly different from what I was hearing from my teachers and reading in my journals. And Alan Ginsberg was kind of punk rock before there was punk rock. You know, he comes out of the beat poet tradition um, and was a Buddhist uh, later on in life. And um, I saw him actually perform with Philip Glass, the Wichita Vortex Sutra in Chicago. So. Um, so anyway, so 
Steve was really shaped by Allen Ginsberg in being true to the human experience that people have and not just reducing things into psychopathological formulations in the DSM. So all of this is to say, if you only know the DSM and you only know how to prescribe medications, you are a psychiatric technician. You're not really a psychiatric professional. To be a professional means you're going above and beyond that basic training of the DSM and um, psychopharmacology. So a paper I wrote um, working with Steve was on the idea of the therapist as a moral agent. And I'm gonna skip through a little bit of this other than just to say it's not a technique, it's a commitment. So it's harder to learn. And the moral relationship in this second paragraph is one based on values of mutuality, respect for the human subjectivity of the other, and a commitment that one's own freedom can only be maximized through, through the cultivation of another's freedom. And so um, Steve brought me along to the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. And it was this place, great place where the, all these human rights therapists, very much you're learning about the world and, and genocides and atrocities going on in the world. You're learning about cutting edge science for how to work with trauma. Um, and you're also learning about just the whole spectrum from, from molecule to um, culture of how trauma affects people. Oops. Okay. So a couple things um, I sort of have developed along the way. I'll just mention these sort of ideas. A counter curriculum, the idea that in addition to a scientific curriculum to be good technicians, we also require a counter curriculum to be good human beings. I call it a counter curriculum because I feel like sometimes you almost have to push back against the formal curriculum um, and you need to create space for yourself as a human being and kind of to refine your soul or to you know, recapture, uh, reconnect to your soul sometimes because the training can be just so draining. Um, sometimes uh, the scientific curriculum, and then also just the work being exposed to um, death and illness and madness and um, addictions and trauma, all these things that we get exposed to, you know, can kind of take the wind out of you. You can feel like you lose your soul in the work. So we need a way to replenish that. Uh, um, I've argued that we need to have continuing human education, not just CME, but CHE. How do we continue to be good human beings, not just good scientists or technicians. And this idea of the compassion revolution, that there's a growing kind of pushback in society that we need to include compassion uh, as a foundational element in professional education and in business as well. This isn't just within healthcare. So um, three different books talking about compassion being a revolutionary act. Um, Robin Youngson says, so if you stand up for caring, compassion, and the humble service of patients and communities, you're a threat to established and powerful interests. This kind of reminds me of Daniel Ofri's um, uh, article. I think it's in the New York Times. Uh, the title is um, something like doctor's commitment, doctors and nurses commitment is killing them. Uh, basically saying that the system set up that we assume doctors and nurses and, and healthcare providers are going to be compassionate, but we don't build that into the way that we train and support people. It's something that's supposed to be done over and above um, just the technical work and the, the EMR and the documentation and everything. So um, uh, Victor Montori out of uh, Mayo says he wants to transform healthcare from an industrial activity uh, from an industrial activity into a deeply human one, capable of providing careful and kind care for all. And then Treziak and Mazzarelli, this whole book, Compassionomics, is basically like a, a sort of a, a literature review of compassion and its effect on uh, healthcare providers as well as healthcare recipients. So they say it matters for everybody in the healthcare system and that compassionate care belongs in the domain of evidence-based medicine. Okay, I think I'm going to skip over this. I talked last time some about Joseph Rael and my work with him. Um, this is an article we wrote in About Place Journal. Um, and just for time, I think I'll skip over this. You've got the slides, so um, you can always take a look at that. Um, I know I've got too many slides here, so I need to skip over a few. So let's 
just mentioned Parker Palmer and the new professional. So Palmer's an educator. There's a ACGME, American Council of Graduate Medical Education Award named the Palmer Award um, because he's also done some work looking at um, professionalism in uh, medical education. So his concept of the new professional is a person who's not only competent in his or her discipline, but has the skill and will to resist and help transform the institutional pathologies that threatens uh, threaten the profession's highest standards. He sounds a little punk rock there even. Um, so, and he says that the education shouldn't rely on teaching emotional distancing, kind of in medicine, what we think of as scientific objectivity as a strategy for survival. Instead, it would teach students to stay close to emotions that might become sources of energy to challenge and change institutions. And emotional intelligence. Yeah, exactly, exactly. He was he might've been writing, this book was 20th anniversary even, I don't know when he wrote it. Um, it was probably around the time emotional intelligence was starting to, to be kind of studied. Um, here's a nice paper. This is in the uh, references, uh, reference 22. If you don't wanna read the whole book, you can just read this paper on, on the new professional. So he says that, that higher education, if it's to serve humane purposes, we who educate must insist that knowing is not enough you know, memorizing facts, information, um, that's not enough. We are not fully human until we recognize what we know and take responsibility for it. So this is kind of like a moral or, or humanistic um, overlay to the objective scientific knowledge that we have. We have a responsibility for how we use it. And Robert J. Lifton, yeah, so he has written a lot. He's an influential person for me. Uh, I did meet him at, at the actually that same conference, the ISTSS conference in DC. He talks about this idea of the witnessing professional. So there's this idea of malignant normality. He talks about where people gradually get used to something happening in a culture. And what seems shocking in the beginning, over time, after, after kind of desensitization to the shocking, and even if the shocks kind of continue and the behavior and, and dialogue gets worse and worse, he says, we kind of adapt to this in, as malignant normality. And our job as witnessing professionals is to draw upon knowledge and experience to reveal the danger of that malignant normality and to actively oppose it. So Lifton studied um, Nazi doctors, he studied Hiroshima survivors, he's written on climate change, uh, he wrote about totalitarian thought reform in China. So he's really, he um, could be called a psychohistorian. You know, he's a psychiatrist, but much of his work has been looking at culture and history and the individual. And so there's a whole issue of, of Daedalus, uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences Journal, where he talks about this idea of the climate swerve. Let's just focus on two things, the climate swerve and point three, which is where we shift from, you know, kind of having a fragmentary awareness of, of the malignant normality. So we've got a fragmentary awareness. We're kind of like something's not right with the climate and the way we're living and shifting it to a formed awareness where he says that we could um, develop climate wisdom. I really love this term, climate wisdom, where we can then see how all the pieces fit together. And when we see how the pieces fit together, we take responsibility for it. Whereas if we just have fragmented understanding, we don't take responsibility. So I interviewed Robert J. Lifton actually back in May of 2021, uh, and uh, the interview is available at this website here. I've got an interview site I run with my friend Usha Kella. Um, and so the thing I asked him was, can we teach this? You know, medical students, residents, they lose idealism. Do we need to somehow help them maintain idealism? And so he says, you know, one reason why the term ethical professional is useful is that it gives one a concept with which to connect one's work and one can see oneself clearly as remaining a professional. So this is a really important point. You remain a professional, not leaving the professional orbit, but using your professional knowledge in a broader context. And there's an increasing recognition on the part of many professionals that what they're doing and thinking is not enough. And there's a hunger among professionals for including an ethical or moral perspective in their professional work. And so he says, if one has the concept of witnessing professional early on in training, there's a place to recover and extend one's idealism that's available in one's mind because it's been placed there early in one's medical or psychological life. And, you know, I've got a bunch more slides and concepts and other applications and different things I did, I've done sort of personally 
But I think what I'm going to do now is stop sharing the screen. And I'd just like to kind of open it up and see where everybody's at with this idea of medical activism and some of your thoughts. I also don't want to, if you're thinking, who is this guy? You know, it, it, the stuff he's done is really not that much of an activist. And, and I wouldn't say, you know, I am like the, I am the embodiment of medical activism. I would say it's been a thread in my career. And, you know, I wrote the, the kind of essay through Johns Hopkins blog, and then that got picked up um, through the Journal of um, Postgraduate Medical Education. There's a, um, a piece on medical activism that somebody out of England, this guy Launer, picked up. And then there's a paragraph talking about, you know, my thoughts and concepts, and then he put it in a larger perspective. Ultimately, I think for medical activism, we need um, to start with, I would look at an edited volume looking at examples of medical activism, uh, looking at specific uh, physicians and other healthcare providers who have embodied medical activism like uh, Mona Hanna Atisha. So any thoughts here, questions, comments? Is it part of professional identity? Is it something we should be teaching? Is it something that is kind of a Pandora's box that we shouldn't open? Hard to know where to start, yeah, yeah. So I think one thing is, you know, that paper I wrote on moral, uh, the therapist is a moral agent. So are you always treating a person in such a way that you are valuing their humanity? So you're doing the technician stuff, but then you're also trying to be a good human with them. And that could be a start, you know, is just trying to be a good human. Then there's a ripple effect from that. You could, um, you know, try to advocate for different things um, that would be important. You could bring in, a friend of mine used to go and teach um, literature uh, and, and meditation in the prisons. Actually, I got a couple of friends who've taught meditation in the prisons. So you could say, hey, you know, I'm going to look in the community, see if I can bring someone in to teach mindfulness to people in prison. Um, then there could be political things you get involved in, um, kind of local community things, getting on boards. So yeah, other thoughts or questions or comments. What humanity is, yeah. Right. And Ryan, you put it in quotes there, humanity, because you could probably come up with a definition of humanity. Um, it might be kind of subjective. Might, maybe people have different elements of it. Actually, you know, my friend Steve Hunt, um, you know, from from uh, Seattle VA is here, and he and I have talked about it before. Of you know, what does it mean to be human? Um, I would say it comes out of sort of a moral relationship, you know, to the individual, um, and a non-reductionistic, non-technical relationship. So there's two ways you can look at this is when you are being reductionistic and technical, you're not really dealing with the full humanity of another person. So that's another reason why we can do our job and then pause and, and step back. And, and I think about, you know, maybe putting on another hat, like at the VA, we have this whole health uh, philosophy and program. So, you know, you do your technical job and then you say, hey, I got this circle of health behind me that's about a whole person. You know, it's, it's about how are you treating your body? What are your relationships like? What are your surroundings like? Um, what's your spirit and soul like? That's actually one of the things we ask people about. Um, where's your mind at? You know, are you, do you have positive thoughts? Do you have negative thoughts? And how do all these fit together? Yeah. Cody. Yeah, I just have a quick comment. Uh, do you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I think the, the, the sticky question that I've always, I've always kind of circled around is the way in which I like the distinction you make between kind of this more technical aspect of our jobs and the way that might dehumanize or, or become sort of a routine in a way that we get caught up in this kind of this, these technicalities of how to do our job and we lose kind of what we're trying to do, which is help people, right? Mm -hmm. And and that it can be, it can have its own conservatism, like this is how it's done. So we stick with this, right? And and and, and change is hard. Um, and I 
I, I was thinking early on, like going through grad school, feeling as if and being taught that there were certain, like, let's say types of therapy that are more conducive towards, uh, towards, you know, looking at a person's humanity and less technical. But as I got into kind of working the VA, it feels more like that is a partisan view in and of itself. Right. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. and that, and that, that itself is, is just, an, is this, is this, kind of weird squabble in, in, in a kind of back academic corner that is, that is a distraction. Um, but, but nonetheless, not feeling like I'm able to get to the point where I understand exactly how do I have a practice that is, uh, that is more conducive to activism in and of itself, rather than adopting practices that become kind of entrenched. And then I become part of this old guard that says, we can't make any change because this is how we do things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks for your comments. Bring up a couple different ideas. So one is um, with the technician and, and the healer. I think of that a lot. And the healer is sort of the the professional who deals with the whole human and the whole human ecosystem, versus the technician, which is like I treat everybody the same according to the protocolized manual that I have. Um, and so a question could be even before you could have medical activism, you might need to have that healer mindset which says, I can be with people in a way to alleviate their suffering that's beyond like, I can prescribe you a medicine or I can't prescribe you a medicine. So in PCMHI, primary care, mental health, sometimes the triages come to me and I could take a really narrow view. It would make my life a lot easier and and less messy. And I'd have fewer people I'd be following up with if I said, do you want a medicine or not? That's what I do. I'm a psychiatrist. And somebody could come in, you know, maybe somebody with a Native American heritage or American Indian, um, and they come in with intergenerational trauma. And I can say, do you want Prozac for that? You know, for your intergenerational trauma? Um, Or I could have such a narrow view that I don't even know what intergenerational trauma is. I don't even have a conception of asking somebody, you know, what their upbringing was like, how their parents grew up, what their grandparents' life was like. Um, so, So another way of putting this in a very simple way could be, how can we create an education system and a healthcare practice system in which we're bringing our minds, the best of our minds, and the best of our hearts? It may be just that simple, you know? If you're working from your heart, that may lead to activism. It may just lead to, you know, being kind to people as while you're prescribing medications because you can prescribe medications and not be kind you know but you could be like i'm going to be kind and i'm going to prescribe medications and so right there you don't necessarily have to go out and march in the streets or carry signs or protest but some people you know say that that kind of compassion though is a revolutionary act because it's not part of your protocol you're kind of deviating from your script in a way and you're saying i know i got you know eight more people to see this this day but i'm going to pause for a minute here and spend some time with this person from my heart because it's morally the right thing to do and it's a harder thing to do too it's much easier to fall in that yeah because we get deadened and and it's you know and the all the time pressure incentives are for us to do more quicker rather than to do less slower So, yeah, anyone else, any final, I think we should probably finish up here. Um, Feel free to email me. Um, uh, Happy to have further discussions, uh, share resources. I think the slides are available for y'all and there's references at the end. So thank you all for coming today.